supposedly we are live. Excellent. So awesome. Uh, yeah. So welcome everybody to MDC 2020. This year is going to be a great little talk on build your first game in JavaScript. Um, our host is Eric. He'll tell you a little bit about himself. Um, my name is Curtis and I am just going to uh, go over some things in the bottom right. So in the bottom right corner of the video, if you don't have it on full screen, you'll see a little survey button and a little questions button. And during the talk, um, you're more than welcome to hit the questions button and ask uh, questions. I will field them and then I'll pass them on to Eric who said he'd like to handle them in real time. So we'll do it that way. Um, and then at the end of this, if you could please hit the survey button and fill out the information just to help us uh, with the logistics and figuring out um, if we did good or if we did bad. So I will shut up and pass the mic over to Eric. Happy Monday and thanks for attending. Happy Monday, everyone. Um, so my talk today is building your first game in JavaScript. Um, I hope we're gonna have a lot of fun. My name is Eric Onerheim uh, and this is the first slide. Uh, here's the next one. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a software engineer that works at Renaissance Learning here in Minneapolis. Uh, downtown. It's actually headquartered in Wisconsin, uh, uh, but we have an office here in downtown that we uh, haven't visited in a while. Uh, I am a hobbyist uh, game developer, so uh, I have made negative dollars, uh, in fact, on uh, making games, uh, sp spending money on hosting and stuff like that. But I've been doing it for a while now, uh, almost eight plus years uh, making games and not making money at it, so that's been pretty good. Uh, pretty good time. Uh, I work in open source, uh, 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 you know, on the side. I uh, have a project called Excalibur JS, which is a uh, open source game engine for building games on the web. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, uh, I'm also a runner, so I uh, run long distances uh, uh, for fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's about it for me. Uh, pretty boring. Um, so, you know, uh, making games for the web. In the, you know, brief, brief history of uh, the web uh, last 20 years, uh, making games for the web uh, was really at the beginning, uh, you know, the realm of plugins, uh, Flash being a very popular one. Uh, I remember a lot of Flash games uh, growing up, uh, a lot of uh, people cut their teeth on game development in, you know, ActionScript or uh, other Flash uh, stuff. So, you know, around, uh, around the time Jobs said, you know, no more Flash, you know, we had the Canvas, which really democratized the ability to make games on the web uh, everywhere and make them really accessible. And the cool thing about building stuff for the web is you really can hit a wide audience uh, and you can really do cool stuff and hit a lot of different device, devices uh, with the canvas. So uh, around when that happened, uh, around when the canvas started to be widely available is when I started making games uh, for the web. Uh, and, uh, you know, side note, uh, TypeScript is pretty great, especially for games, because uh, a lot of times you wind up with a big code base uh, and TypeScript makes it easy to, to wrangle that. Um, now, if you don't like TypeScript, that's okay. This still applies, uh, you know, as much as you want. So, cool. So, let's get right into it, you know. Uh, so, we talked a little bit about that Canvas. Uh, so, here's the Canvas. Uh, uh, the Canvas uh, has a width and a height uh, in uh, attribute. Uh, as attributes, and that's the resolution of your canvas. Uh, it can also have a width and a height specified uh, in CSS, and you'll note that they're different here. Uh, so you can uh, stretch your canvas if you want. And I have a little picture here that will help uh, demonstrate that in a bit. So if you wanted to create a canvas, there's two ways to do it. You can create it programmatically uh, using document create element, and you can set your resolution. And that's that's perfectly okay way to do it. Um, and you can insert it into the DOM, you know, document.body, uh, append child. 
you can also make it in the DOM. So uh, you can do canvas with height, uh, and that's perfectly OK, too. Depending on what you want to do, uh, it might make sense to do one or the other. Um, so here's what I was talking about with uh, resolution. Uh, so these two canvases have the same resolution, 100 by 100 pixels, but uh, the one on the right is stretched uh, with CSS. So um, you might want to do this um, if you want to support uh, multiple you know, screen layouts or if you're going for a particular look. Um, uh, potentially, uh, there's a, a style of game that you want that uh, like classically might have had a stretched look. Um, uh, but more often than not, you're looking to support multiple device uh, uh, layouts. And so you might do it, find it a little bit of stretching to be ex acceptable to make that happen. OK, so we've talked about the canvas a little bit, about the element. Now that we have that canvas, you know, let's paint that masterpiece. You know, how do we, how do we attack that canvas and uh, make it our own and make our own games? And uh, uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge fan of Bob Ross. Uh, it's my favorite television to watch idly uh, while I'm doing something else. Uh, oftentimes I'll be cooking dinner and we'll put on Bob Ross and then I'll look back and then suddenly uh, there's a mountain. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So anyway, uh, let's, let's paint some happy pictures here. Um, so once you have a, a canvas element, you can get at a graphics context from that canvas element, and then it allows you to paint directly to it. Um, so in here, we are getting the 2D context. Uh, there are other contexts that can be retrieved. Uh, there's a WebGL one, uh, which allows you to do uh, WebGL 3D programming. There's uh, WebGL2, which isn't supported everywhere, but uh, as far as I know, it might be. Uh, uh, but today, we're only really going to talk about the 2D, because uh, that's easier to wrangle in my brain. Uh, WebGL is its own talk by itself, for sure. So uh, get to some happy rectangles. So you know, the first thing you might want to do as an aspiring artist uh, looking at Bob Ross, you might want to draw some rectangles to help with your masterpiece. And in that graphics context, uh, you can set the current state of the context. Uh, uh, fill style is one of them. Any valid CSS color is good here. Red is a well-known CSS color, but you can also put a hex string in here if you desired a, you know, a more ro robust control over your colors. And then you can uh, call uh, off of the graphics context that you've uh, assembled, uh, fill rect, which will go ahead and produce a rectangle at uh, where its top left edge is at coordinate 50, 50, uh, and it's 100 and by 100. You can do uh, similar stuff with lines. Uh, you can set, like you set the fill style, you can set the stroke style. Again, any valid CSS string is good here. And you can also set the line width. So uh, this is useful uh, if you want to highlight something and, uh, or you want to outline something. And then uh, I believe any unit is good here. Uh, I usually only use pixels. But um, you know, trust but verify on that one. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Uh, so here's a rectangle. I know, very exciting. Um, let's see if I can grab this drawer. Ooh. So, um, uh, you know, if we have a rectangle here, uh, uh, and here's the code that we were looking at just a few moments ago, we can change it. Um, uh, so, lime is another one of my favorite CSS colors. Um, uh, it, I believe this is assumed to be pixels. I didn't put a unit in here. Uh, but you can also change the line width. Uh, and you can make your happy little rectangles. Um, so that's pretty compelling. The most powerful shape in game development is the rectangle, in my opinion. Um, so if you, uh, uh, if you need to get started building a game, I recommend with, starting with a rectangle. Um, uh, they're great. Uh, so you, know, you may have anticipated that the circle is next. Uh, very similar properties. We won't linger too long on those. So you kind of get the gist. Uh, but uh, this is a slightly different. Um, you use uh, a method called arc to draw an arc. Uh, uh, and in this case, I'm going 
all the way around two pi. Uh, uh, that is two pi radians, which is 360 degrees. Um, and then you can call the fill and stroke methods to produce a similar effect. This is using uh, something in the graphics context that is uh, the path API. So you can set down paths and then trace them with fill or stroke. So you can do really cool stuff. There's a project out there that uh, will take SVG graphics and trace out those SVG graphics into Canvas. And uh, I wish I remembered the name of it off the top of my head. Um, but uh, very cool stuff. Uh, so, and as you might've expected, you can do that circle thing and we can go pull that open. Uh, again, lime is always the best circle, especially if you're making uh, you know, a summery drink. Uh, lime is great for that. Uh, so that's how you might do circles uh, in, the, in the graphics context. So whew, we've covered squares and circles. We're moving quick. Uh, and the next thing you might want to do is text. Uh, again, some similar properties. But then there's a few differences here. Uh, you can set your font. Uh, and, and here I say 80 pixels consolus. Um, and one tricky thing here is you'll want to specify font fallbacks if you know a particular font like consolus is not available on the system. Uh, you can also specify something like sans serif, which, you know, which is a safe one. Um, uh, and then you can go ahead and fill and stroke text. Uh, one cool thing is emojis totally work. Uh, so you, get, uh, you can get a heart in there. Uh, if you uh, are of the Windows 10 uh, persuasion, you can use the emoji keyboard and put your favorite emoji, which is the ghost emoji. Uh, I know everyone was saying out loud, but you can go ahead and draw emojis uh, with the text graphics API. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Why do I need to make graphics at all, at all if I can just use emojis? It'd be really cool to make a game where all of the assets were just emojis. So that's, go, go do that, that'd be really fun. You might have some platform inconsistencies in your graphics, but it would be pretty cool. Uh, awesome. So we've gotten squares, circles, text, especially emojis. Uh, you might wanna draw images now. Um, so uh, it's relatively, uh, relatively, easy uh, and relatively complex. Um, so let's say I have this image at the top. Uh, 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 you can tell that I'm where I'm maybe leaning with this, uh, but I have this image at the top and I might wanna draw it. Uh, what, I, what I can do is go ahead and create a new image. This is just an HTML image element. Uh, set the source to my path and I can only actually use that image against the graphics context once it's loaded. Um, so you wanna make sure that you watch for that load before you try to use it, otherwise it won't work. It won't throw an error, it just won't draw anything. Um, optionally, you might wanna say your image smoothing enabled to false, especially if you're doing something with like pixel art. So uh, if you wanna do pixel art, um, setting that to false means you get that kind of sharp edge there that you might want as part of your aesthetic. Now, if you're doing something else where you have higher fidelity images, this might not be something you want. You might want that smoothing uh, available to you. Um, so now that I have this image loaded, how do I draw it? Uh, so let's take a look. So the first way I can do it is I can call draw image, the aptly named draw image, and I can specify where it goes. So I am taking that whole image that you saw before, and I'm just plopping it the top left corner at zero, zero, and then it just fills out the natural size of that image across the canvas. Pretty sweet, that's, that's pretty awesome. I can also do draw image, uh, specify a coordinate, but I can also specify width and height. So if I'm like, well, I really wanna squish it, uh, I can do that. So in here, I, I squished it to 50 by 50, uh, not the best look honestly. I probably wouldn't do that with this image. And the last way we can do this is with the, uh, the full overload, which allows you to specify a source window to pull out from your image and a destination. So in this one, I am plucking that fourth image out of that source. So I'm going uh, 
96 pixels in the X, zero in the Y, grabbing a width of 32 and a height by 32, plucking that out, and I'm plopping it to the destination of zero, zero, and 32 by 32. So with this example, you can kind of see how you might do sprite sheets. Um, so you might you know, pluck out images from here or there in like a big image uh, and draw them in specified locations. And in fact, this can be important um, especially for like performance, uh, sprite sheets can be a form of bundling. Uh, you can uh, pack all of your images into one image uh, and then pick out the pieces you want and you only have to wait for one image to download. Now there's, there's probably a point of diminishing returns there. Uh, you know, if you had a couple gigabyte image, that might be not great. Uh, but uh, there's probably some give and take there. Cool. So, I'd be remiss to not mention high DPI displays because that's a new thing. And uh, you know, around the software world, high DPI is wrecking people's days. Um, and there is a particular problem if you're using high DPI displays with the canvas. Um, and we'll touch on it briefly. And that's if you are on a high DPI display, your logical pixels, the ones that your JavaScript wants to work in and your CSS wants to work in, uh, don't map. Uh, to your device pixels. In fact, they're different. Uh, so there's a property that hangs off window called the device pixel ratio, which gives you this ratio between your device and your logical pixels. So um, this might not be super clear over Zoom, so I apologize, but trust me, uh, the one on the left is blurry. Uh, so uh, for a device pixel ratio of two, uh, it's really apparent in text. Uh, but it's really quite blurry over here. And the reason is because uh, things are drawn with your logical pixels. And then because your device has twice as many pixels, it has to stretch that logical image across your device uh, in order for it to be presented accurately. Um, the one on the right has some correction to make that work, a nice crisp correction. Um, and the way that's done is by scaling up your logical width and height by your device pixel ratio. Um, uh, so I won't linger on this too much longer, uh, but if you run into this, uh, there's a great article on MBN I recommend reading uh, if you wanna learn more. But uh, just if you're saying, oh man, everything is kind of blurry and I don't want it to be, check out uh, high DPI correction, so. All right, so we've made a lot of progress. We've talked about how to draw stuff. Now we want to move stuff around. Uh, so one way to do that is with something called affine transformations. And affine is a fancy way of saying, I want things to stay in the same space, but I want them to you know, translate, rotate, or scale. So kind of like this uh, uh, crazy beating heart that we got here. Um, so let's talk about translate, rotate, and scale as it relates to the graphics context. So pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you can call translate. You can call rotate. That's in radians. So uh, you know, you know, math math.pi divided by two. That pi over two is ninety degrees. Um, or you can scale by a factor. So in this case, I'm scaling uh, both in the x and the y by two. So making the image twice as big. Uh, so pretty great, awesome. That's a great way to move things around uh, and to rotate them. So I have a little demo here. We can maybe demonstrate some of that really quick. Uh, you know, we can rotate this guy. We can get him really big. He's kind of fun to, you know, like maybe some nightmare fuel. But you can kind of see, you know, oh, this is pretty slick. And the, and the nice thing here too is I don't have to redefine, remember that draw image uh, I'd have to, you know, maybe recalculate the coordinates that I would need to do. I don't even sure how I would do that with the rotate. Um, but uh, here, uh, it makes it a lot easier to move things around. So once you're moving stuff around, you might want to move a lot of things around. So when you call translate, say, or translate, rotate, and scale, that affects the global context as a whole. So if you want one thing to translate and not another thing, you need to use save and restore. And what does that do? Save grabs the current state of your context, uh, squirrels it away uh, so that it's safe, uh, and restore puts it back again. 
So uh, that way you can operate on a particular image uh, kind of locally and not affect other images that you might want to draw later on. So in general, uh, when you're doing transformations on a context, you might do save and restore to wrap those to allow you to transform only a very specific thing that you care about. So that's save and restore. And really think of them as bookends. A lot of, a lot of the time that's where you use them is you have this kind of this inner goo uh, uh, and then you wrap them uh, like so. Cool. Whew. That's a lot of drawing stuff. I know I might need a break, but we've got a lot of stuff on the screen now. We want it to move around. Uh, so one technique, one strategy uh, in, the, in the biz, air quotes, is the game loop. And what is the game loop? It's really an infinite loop. So while true, draw my stuff. Uh, while true, update my stuff, draw my stuff. Move it around, draw it again. And this uh, allows you to create the illusion of animation. So if you're moving stuff and drawing it, you know, every 16 milliseconds, you can create this smooth image over time. And that's really how all of these uh, screens that we're watching right now work. It's just a series of static images uh, played really fast. Um, uh, so much so that the human brain just interprets it as motion. So that's a little bit of what the game loop gives you. How do you do this on the web? So it's really, it's really, uh, really cool now. Uh, request animation frame is available uh, uh, as far as I know, pretty much everywhere you want to be for a game. Uh, the old way you might do this would be with set timeout to schedule your next frame or set interval uh, to schedule your frames if you can't use request animation frame. So what's happening here? So I've created a, uh, a main loop here. It's really an infinite loop. Uh, main loop starts. And once it starts, it immediately reschedules itself. And then it'll go ahead and update and draw my game. And then it'll start again. And you might be thinking, OK, well, that's, that's pretty cool. Why can't I use set interval or a set timeout? That seems clearer to me, uh, and it's a little easier to understand. Well, I'd say you're probably right about that. Uh, the nice thing about request animation frame is it's scheduled with your browser's uh, paint cycle. So you can make sure that you're hitting the, the vSync uh, of your browser so that things line up when you're drawing instead of like maybe shifting over time, you like where you're painting in the middle of a frame. This, this way you are painting consistently every frame. That's why you wanna use it if you can. But set interval and uh, set timeout work just fine if those are the only things available to you. Cool. So uh, now that you have an infinite loop, you wanna know some things about it. Like, you know, you wanna make sure you have that FPS. That's important. Uh, especially when you're uh, trying to sell your game, you know, you run at 60 frames. Uh, so how do you calculate 60 frames per second? Well, if you measure how long your frame takes, uh, and let's say it takes 16.6 .6 milliseconds per frame, uh, how do we get FPS out of that? Well, you can convert that into seconds per frame. Uh, and then you can say, well, we have the right units, seconds per frame, they're just on the wrong side. You can take the inverse and you get 60 frames per second. Yay. And here's the code to do that. So, uh, in the old world, we might have used date.now to get the current time in milliseconds. Uh, but now we have a high resolution timer, performance.now, which will give you microsecond precision. Uh, uh, and this way you can time how long each uh, frame has taken. Uh, and then that calculation that you saw above is just right here, is a one over elapsed time converted to seconds. So that'll give you FPS. Pretty cool. So FPS uh, is great. One thing you want to keep in mind when you're building your game is you want to use uh, time-based movement. Let's just clean that up a little bit. You want to do time-based movement. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me show you what I mean. So in this little demo here, you can see that the blue and the yellow seem to be moving about at the same speed at one frame per second. But what happens if 
my and my computer starts moving faster well that blue one just took off what's happening there well what's happening is that movement is not being scaled by the amount of time that the frame takes so you can see this yellow one perceptually it's running at the same speed even though i'm jumping all over the place with frames per second and that's what you might want in your game you want no matter how the device is doing how uh, you want a consistent behavior. You don't want things to break or change just because the device is faster or slower. So this is why you might use time-based movement. Now in the past, uh, like in Nintendo or some of the older consoles, a lot of the developers could count on the CPU being at a certain speed. Um, so they didn't really need to do this. They could say, well, the hardware is always going to be this processor and I know how fast it goes. Uh, so they didn't have to do that. Uh, and this is how it might look. Um, so that time-based aspect there that you saw is scaling that velocity, uh, you know, uh, and the units I'm using here are pixels per second. So that's just an easy one for me to grok, uh, to understand in my head. Um, if I know things are moving at a certain pixel per second, really easy to follow. Awesome. Cool, so that's time-based movement. That might be why you want to use it. Um, uh, but if you're just starting out and you're just fiddling around, it might not be important to you. It might be okay. Whew. We moved pretty far, pretty fast. It's a whirlwind of making a game. So we got things drawing and moving. Now we want to interact. Uh, and this is a great one. Uh, uh, I want to play this game now. Uh, so how do we interact? So some of the primary ways that we interact is the keyboard. So in this animation, I'm showing WASD, W-A-S-D being pressed, and they're landing into uh, a structure that I call a key buffer. I think other people might call it that too, but I call it a key buffer. And I'm gonna try to convince you that you want a key buffer and not to wire all of your game logic to event handlers. Uh, event handlers are cool and dope, and uh, but as soon as you have like 400 keyboard event handlers, it gets really hard to track down what's going on. Also, um, those event handlers uh, can really gum up the speed of your game. So I'm going to make a suggestion that you do one keyboard event handler and you store the keys that it sees in a key buffer. Uh, and really what that means is a list uh, of strings that uh, when you press key down, you put the key in there. When you, when you lift off the key, you take it out again. This gives you the ability uh, to inspect the key buffer in your main loop uh, and say, is this key pressed or not? Uh, uh, and not have to worry about handlers. Uh, it works really, really well. So that's gonna be my recommendation. So let's take a look at this here. Uh, let's have a quick little demo here. I can punch some keys here. You can see how much key rollover I have in my keyboard. That's about it. Um, you know, you can press the shift key here, start up sticky keys. Um, and then this is, the, this is the same data structure that you saw before. Uh, we're just throwing keys in there and then we can inspect them in our main loop here. Uh, not super important, but uh, we can go ahead and do something with our keys every frame and not have to worry about it gumming up our main loop. Cool. And then, you know, my advice for the pointer is gonna sound eerily similar. Uh, I recommend you just, you keep track of your position in one spot. You have one handler and you keep track of that so you can reference it in your main loop. Um, one subtlety uh, to uh, pointer moves uh, is you'll want to do a little math to determine where the pointer is inside of your canvas. Uh, your canvas not, might not be positioned directly on the left most, left topmost portion of your screen. So you'll need to know where it is in the page uh, in order to create that calculation so that you can say, oh, when I put my pointer at the leftmost portion of the canvas, wherever it is on, in the page, I get what I'm expecting for my game. So let's take a look at that. Uh, and here we are. Ta-da, it's a circle that follows my mouse. That's a very compelling demo. I know you're all very exciting. I, I can hear it. I can hear it over at the Zoom. Awesome, okay, that's a lot of stuff. Audio, 
let's listen to some Daft Punk. All right, so audio is pretty cool now. Uh, so in the past, uh, you couldn't really do audio on the web very easily. Uh, you, uh, when, when uh, you know, Canvas first came out, a lot of the techniques were, you know, plugin based or flash based um, or doing creative things with the audio tag element uh, to make it play. But now, 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 there is a very shiny web audio API that is pretty much everywhere. Um, and the way this works is it's a, it's a node, uh, it's a graph based API. So you construct these different nodes to assemble your final audio. The destination is your speakers. Um, so inside of this audio context, you can create uh, any number of source nodes, and then you can manipulate them with various different nodes provided by the API. So a gain node uh, is uh, audio speak for volume. So if you want to turn it up or down, panner node is if you want to go left or right, uh, and you want to compose all of those transformations of your audio together into a final sound. Um, so that's pretty cool. In fact, it's super, super robust. I even saw someone make a vocoder uh, using the web audio API. So you can, you can directly fiddle with all of the audio bits if you wanted or not. That's maybe not everyone, but that's something that one could do, uh, which would be pretty cool. So let's take a look at how that's done. Um, so, um, creating an audio context, not super bad, new audio context. Um, the one weird thing about it, and it's, this is a good thing is you need to unlock it, uh, with a user gesture and what you were thinking, why would you need to do that? Well, that's mostly because, um, uh, you don't want ads on your page, like randomly <laughs> playing audio at you. It'd be pretty terrible. Uh, so, uh, a user must interact with um, uh, the page in some way to create the audio context. So in this way, I can unlock it, so to speak, uh, so that I can use it. Uh, so that's the one weird oddity with the audio context is it needs to be created or unlocked via a user gesture uh, to prevent that bad actor scenario we talked about. Cool. So uh, uh, using that fancy async await, uh, we can download audio. So you might go and get a audio MP3. So you might use the fancy pants fetch API that is available most places now uh, to go ahead and download that uh, buffer of audio. So that's a binary stream of an MPM or an MP3 file. Um, so in order for the audio context to use that, it needs to be decoded from MP3 to a raw audio format that it can use. So uh, you call the audio context decode audio data, the aptly named, uh, and you get the decoded buffer out that then can be used as a source in your uh, audio graph to play sound. Yes, awesome. So you might then take that audio and you might wanna mess with the volume. So again, gain is volume. Uh, you can set the value directly. So uh, it's between zero and one, uh, one being at max volume, uh, half being at half volume, uh, and zero being very quiet, <laughs> imperceptible. Um, so you can set that directly. It's a little jarring to the ears if you set that mid play. What I might suggest is setting target at time, which will exponentially ramp to a volume over a certain time step. Um, this is a little more pleasant. In this example, I'm ramping to a half uh, uh, given the current audio time uh, down 0.1 time steps. Not super important. This is, works pretty good. There's a great uh, MDM article on this uh, with samples uh, and you can kind of fiddle with it to get something that is pleasant to the ear. Cool. Well, once you've done that, you saw in that first picture that everything was connected. Well, that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, we're gonna connect up all those nodes that we had uh, we're going to take that source, connect it to the volume, and then connect that to the destination and go ahead and play it. Um, you don't need to provide arguments. It'll just start playing it. Uh, you can tell it when you want to start playing. So if you wanted to delay you, uh, a delay in the audio, you could. Uh, you can also skip into the audio with an offset. Uh, you can also tell it how long you want it to play with that duration. Um, but start's the way to do it. Cool. Um, 
hopefully this does not uh, destroy your ears, but I'm gonna try to play something and it might, may or may not work over Zoom. In theory, I'm sharing my audio. Yeah, a friend of mine did this <laughs> for one of our games. Um, so all of this put together is, is what I showed you. Um, really, really straightforward, uh, especially now with async await. Before async and await, you had to do this with callbacks, and that was just no fun. So here, uh, I have a question real quick. Sure. So, uh, Cameron asks, can you do a sound sprite sheet since start takes a when argument? You totally could. You totally could do that. And uh, that is definitely something I would consider uh, if you had a lot of audio effects in your game. Uh, for a similar reason why you might do a sprite sheet with images, uh, you, you, it acts like bundling. So you only download one file for your entire game potentially or uh, just a couple files for your entire game. But yeah, you could do kind of audio, you could sample that audio file where you need to for your effects. That could totally work. That's totally a thing, totally. Awesome. Take a brief pause for any more questions. We're moving fast. I'm gonna take us up here. Mm. All right, collisions. A a topic that could be its own talk on its own, or several talks, or a book, several books. But I'm gonna cover it in about two minutes. All right, so how, how do you collide stuff? So circles aren't too bad. Uh, if you wanna tell if two circles have collided, really, you can take uh, those two circles and if the sum of their radii uh, is, uh, uh, bigger than the distance between them, then they must have collided. Uh, uh, the diagram kind of helps demonstrate that. There's some math there. You know, you can put your hand over the screen and ignore that if you want. If you if you think about it, if the distance between the two circles is smaller than the sum of their radii, they must have collided, right? You know. Da, 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 da. All right. Um, but uh, so the same thing kind of applies with boxes, um, if you think about it just in two different dimensions. So if you take two boxes, uh, like we have on the screen, and you draw like another box around them, so you have that dashed line. If you draw another box around them, and that would be smaller than the combined width and heights of your two boxes, uh, they must have intersected as well. Um, uh, and that, that kind of makes sense, uh, maybe uh, if you think about it as, uh, you know, just another dimension of the circle. Uh, but really, if you draw another box around your two boxes and that box is smaller than the two boxes combined would be, it must have collided. Same reasoning as the circles. Um, pretty cool. It took me a while to get there. Um, I remember when I had that realization in my brain and uh, it was profound. It was a profound experience. Um, uh, another uh, way you can do a uh, collision uh, detecting a collision is using a tile-based approach. So if you have a point that you're interested in, uh, let's say this uh, point three two on the diagram, uh, you can map it into your tile structure and in your tile structure you might mark tiles as solid or not and makes it pretty fast to know if something is collided, if the, a particular point is in a solid tile. Uh, you take that point, you go ahead and divide it by your tile width uh, take the floor, go ahead and look it up in your tile structure. Bam, you're there. Makes it really, really fast to make levels. Uh, and you can do really crazy stuff where your level ed editor could be like a text document. Uh, as long as your tiles are uniform width and height, makes it really fast. And it's a really valid way, a really common way to do collision really quickly. Another technique, uh, and this is kind of an optimization technique, is doing uh, spatial partitioning uh, uh, and grouping objects together. So if I wanted to say, does the purple square collide with the yellow circle? Um, I might say, well, actually, I don't need to test because they, are, they can't possibly collide because they are in separate groups. So that might make it faster for you to, to do this test. Otherwise, you might have to say, well, kind of on a naive approach, you'd have to check every object uh, apart from the purple 
square to see if they've collided. So this is, makes it a quick way to know if you've collided uh, as well and really speed things up. Cool, so now that you know that something's collided, uh, how, do you, how do you respond? How do you deal with that? Um, you have this knowledge now that things are, are, are not where they should be uh, and you need to correct it. So there's a couple, a couple scenarios here that might be you know, pretty clear. Uh, the one on the left here, you say, well, it would be le the least jarring if I move that, that blue guy up a little bit out of the red one. And same for the one on the right. You know, like, all right, that might be uh, an appropriate way to do this. And you know, this type of resolution is called a minimum translation vector, which is a mouthful. Uh, but really, it's what what is the smallest distance I can move that's the least uh, terrifying, you know, to the user. And this makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then you know, you might run into a scenario like this where they equally are in both dimensions and you're like, well, this is really a game by game decision. It might not make sense for you to go left or go up. Um, uh, it really is up to the game developer to figure out what should happen here. And after this, you might uh, impart some physics. Um, I really recommend reading the Wikipedia article on impulse uh, uh, collision systems, impulse uh, collision resolution. Uh, it's uh, not super, dense like some <laughs> it is a little dense okay it is a little dense but uh it's it's one of the better written wikipedia wikipedia articles on like collision resolution so you might not have like physics in your game like in that sense you might be making a mario type game and where mtb minimum translation vector might be all you need uh with some gravity that might be all you need for your game but maybe you need you know you're doing some you know uh, angry birds and you need some physics and that's when you might do a uh, physics based resolution in addition cool Whew. awesome so that's we're 40 minutes in we we blasted through like a lot of topics really fast so uh, i would just want to name drop a couple cool things that you might want to check out there's the gamepad api so you can use like one of these guys um to do like to interact with a website uh, which would be a really profound way to uh, navigate the web, I think. Um, there's the full screen API that allow you to take full screen control uh, with uh, user permission. Uh, there's the new WebGL2, which adds some extra features and optimizations that you might want if you're doing WebGL or 3D stuff. I check that out. There's the up and coming WebGPU, which is uh, based on Vulkan Metal, uh, the, uh, which are graphics APIs uh, even lower level than WebGL uh, to get you even more speed out of that GPU. So just a few things to name drop if you want to check those out um, for making your game. Uh, I really do think the 2D canvas will get you pretty far uh, without having to reach into WebGL or WebGPU. Uh, but you might, you might be interested. Oh, and I forgot about WebUSB. Um, uh, the potential to interact with peripherals. Uh, might be cool. Enough said. All right, so I've taken you on this journey of how to do everything kind of uh, with vanilla JavaScript. Hey, Eric. Uh, oh, yes. Just to make sure, the uh, we got a question about what was the <clears throat> Wikipedia on collision. Oh, uh, yes. Is it, uh, is it the collision? I posted one, collision response. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you Google impulse collision response, that might be the one. And so I posted in the um, chat on our channel some links to the actual um, list he had before. So for the full screen API, the collision response of Wikipedia, the gamepad API are there in the chat if you can see that. Awesome. Uh, I can't see the chat, but I will, I will drop in later. Um, I think all the people watching can. Uh, all right. I hope. Cool. <laughs> awesome. So I took you through that whirlwind journey uh, to uh, talk about uh, Excalibur, um, uh, which is one of many game engines. Uh, there are a lot out there for the web. Uh, uh, there's Impact, which was one of the first, uh, and it's still really good. Phaser is really popular. Melon.js, Play Canvas, Pixie, 3.js, Kiwi. A lot of these game engines uh, do things a little differently. A lot of them do a lot of things the same. Uh, so you won't hurt my feelings if you use something other than 
uh, Excalibur, uh, full disclosure. Uh, uh, I work on this with a few buddies uh, here in the cities uh, and a few people from around the world. Uh, but this is our open source uh, game engine uh, for doing a lot of the things we talked about uh, quickly. Uh, uh, and so you don't need to build those vanilla components uh, necessarily. But you might, you know, you might, you might want to do that. Uh, you might not want to take a dependency on an engine. But uh, uh, if you take a look at Excalibur here, we're at version 0 0.24.2, which is all good software. Starts with a zero, I guess. Uh, joke, <laughs> insert joke here. Um, but we have a lot of samples. Uh, we have some gallery things where we've built games for Ludum Dare. Uh, you can take take a look at those. I recommend looking at the samples. Those jam, uh, those games we built for Ludum Dare were game jam games where we built them as fast as possible, which are probably not the best, like a reference for code, uh, in the world. So I would uh, I would take a look at those. But we have a lot of things that you might want. We talked about the gamepad. We have some physics in there. Uh, we have utilities to work with, uh, sprites and animations, uh, so you don't have to. So to get started, uh, NPM or your favorite uh, JavaScript package manager will suffice. Uh, a lot of folks use Unpackage uh, to download the raw script and include it on your page. That's totally cool too. Um, uh, with uh, ES style imports, you can suck in the engine, uh, create that uh, resolution of a game that you want. Uh, remember, uh, we saw that canvas element in that context. This handles all of that stuff for you, including all of that high DPI business uh, directly for you. You can go ahead and, if you want pixel art, you can go ahead and set your anti-aliasing uh, on or off. If you, uh, if you want your pixel art, uh, you wanna set it to false. Uh, uh, you, want that, you want the aliasing, you want the sharp edges. Uh, and then you can load assets. So remember those images and those audio things, you wanna load those assets and then start your game. Pretty cool. Uh, so one technique that we, we've, we use is we have a file that holds on to all of our assets. Uh, you can load your images, uh, kind of in an ES style import, um, and load them up into a dictionary that you can use later. Uh, you can add them to the loader. Uh, assets need to be loaded before they can be used. Uh, and we have a convenient loader that will draw you a little nice progress bar uh, as it's loading assets. Uh, and then you can go ahead and start your game when everything is loaded. Cool. All right. So that's kind of the boilerplate. That's how you get started. Um, like really just with a blank screen, you know, got everything loaded. We haven't really built a game yet. Uh, now we want to get started building a game. So the way that Excalibur works in a lot of ways uses kind of a theater metaphor. Uh, you deal with scenes and actors. Uh, and there can only be one scene at a time, like they're like in a real play. Uh, and you can have multiple actors on a scene at a time. Uh, and you might think of uh, different scenes as different levels. You can use them that way. You might use them as different screens. Um, you might use them that way. Uh, that's kind of how the metaphor works. So uh, in a particular engine, uh, you'll have a current scene and you can move between them if you want. Uh, and in one scene, you'll have some actors uh, that can be initialized. Uh, so you might have logic that you want to run one time uh, uh, independent of the constructor. You might not want to have like a lot of heavy lifting in your constructor to make your, your bootstrapping a little faster. You want to lazily un initialize your actors. That might be why you want to uh, stick stuff in init. Uh, and then they will update and they will draw. And they will do that uh, in that infinite loop that we talked about called the main loop and Excalibur helps you manage that. Cool. And here's what that code looks like. Um, so we create a new engine, we create a new scene, we create a new actor, all those three components. Uh, we can add actors to a scene, and then we can take, tell the engine to go to that scene. So we want a particular scene to be our level. We can go ahead and go to that level, and that'll start being updated and drawn in the scene. If a scene is not active, if it's not the current scene, it is not updated or drawn. So something to keep in mind. Cool, and here's what a, you know, a potential player uh, class might look like. 
uh, I'm using ES classes here. Um, and I might want to create a player based on the Excalibur actor base type. And you have a, a couple of cool options available to you. You have that on initialize that you can override. It's very C-sharp. Uh, you can tell where we got our inspiration from. Uh, you can hook into the post update, uh, which is usually what you want. You also have a pre-update if you want. Uh, post update, I uh, usually want that because it takes advantage of all of the things that Excalibur does for you in the core update loop. Uh, so post update is usually what you want. And then post draw, you might want to do your own custom drawing to that uh, rendering context that we've been talking about so much. Uh, so you can really do it all uh, if you want, or not if you don't want to. So let's talk about animation because uh, we, we've shown this image before and you might have thought to yourself, oh, that looks like an animation to me. Uh, How is that going to work? Uh, so we have a concept of sprite sheets where you can slice and dice uh, given uh, that image resource. You can see I have it referenced right here. It's already loaded in this case. Uh, I could say, well, I have eight columns that I want to dice. I have one row, and each sprite is 32 by 32. So once I've done that, I can get an animation out of there by specifying the two frames I'm interested in. So I'm interested in frames two and three because I want that that really awesome blink animation for my idle animation. And I want to specify the duration of each of those frames. So 800 milliseconds in this case. Uh, I can then add those to an actor uh, and uh, with a, a name. Uh, usually we have a constants uh, or a string enum for these things. And then I can tell it to display that animation at a particular time. So that allows you to uh, create well-named animations uh, if you don't want to pass animation references around uh, and show those on demand. Pretty cool. Input is uh, really sugar for that key, uh, key buffer that we were talking about before. Um, there's like a little helper here that tells you if a key is pressed, if it's held, or if it was pressed. Uh, uh, and this might be something you might want to do uh, to move characters around on the screen. So uh, you might say, well, if the left key is pressed, I want to switch the velocity to the left 150 pixels per second. If it's right, I want to go 150 pixels per second to the right. If I want to jump, I want a, an impulse of 400 up. Um, and I might want to set a flag there, whether or not they're on the ground. Cool. Uh, collision. So there was a lot of that collision talk that we talked about. Uh, and here's a big table of all the different types of collision things. Don't look at it. Um, the gist is, uh, by default, collision's turned off uh, for performance. Uh, so uh, objects will pass right through each other, like in this example. The one subtlety is you can have passive collisions where they'll pass right through each other, but you might want an event knowing that you a collision was detected. But you don't want any resolution to happen. You might want active, which will allow things to bounce off of each other, uh, such as these two uh, balls in this case. Uh, they'll bounce right off, and uh, they'll have like a physical response, impulse response. Uh, and then there's the last one, which is fixed, which is you know maybe you have some ground or you have an immovable object that does not respond, but it still will stick in place. So it's kind of think of it like an immovable object, but other things will bounce off of it. That's collision in Excalibur. And this is the gist of how to switch those bits. You know, set the collision type, you're good to go. Keeping it simple. Uh, audio uh, is a lot, lot easier to deal with than uh, you, you uh, even though the audio context stuff wasn't too bad. Uh, play, pause, and stop. Uh, pause doesn't rewind the audio. That's the only difference between pause and stop. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, once they're loaded, you can play them. Cool. So let's, let's take a look at a demo. Uh, and let's see if I can get out of this full screen view. We'll refresh this guy. So, uh, in theory, there's audio here. So this is the Excalibur, uh, platformer demo talking and playing at the same time is hard. Uh, you can hear, 
Awesome. So very small platformer, but that's a lot of what we were talking about. And let's take a look at the code really quick. I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but this is kind of all of the pieces put together that we talked about. Um, uh, there's that uh, engine that you know and love uh, with the color. Uh, there's that loader to load all of our assets. We can take a look at our resources being added to our loader. Uh, you can see we got all of the different audio and images here. We can even take a look at some of those. You know, we can see this, the MPC balloon, like very MS Paint. Uh, you can see that sprite sheet that we cared about. Uh, and then that particular player example that we were curious about, uh, we set up our collision. I, uh, I went in depth a little further in this, but uh, you don't have to go this far to make collisions work. Um, if you don't want to. Uh, I have a smaller bounding box uh, for collision than I do for the drawing, so that's why it's a little different. But here's that information that you saw before, uh, and we're able to change the animation here based on the direction that the player is going. So that's, that's pretty slick. So that was a whirlwind tour of a lot of stuff, and we are like at time, basically. <laughs> Uh, but there's a few things I want to plug. ExcaliburJS.com is the website. We have a ton of documentation. Uh, we're always looking for contributors. So if folks want to uh, help out. Uh, I picked a blue background, which unfortunately is, plays havoc with links. Uh, so that's all that these are here as the links. But uh, Robert Nystrom did a great book on game programming patterns. I would check that out. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network has a bonkers good intro to game development. Uh, article that I really recommend you check out. Uh, there's a all the sound effects for this presentation were generated with JFXer, uh, which is a way of generating kind of those Mario-esque uh, sound effects. And if you're really interested in WebGL, there's a really great website called WebGL Fundamentals, which I recommend. Uh, and then there's a library for working with WebGL called, I believe it's pronounced Twiggle, uh, uh, which helps a lot of the repetitiveness of OpenGL or WebGL, excuse me, uh, Freudian slip. Uh, all right, so whew, that, was, that was pretty fast. Uh, and uh, do we have any other questions here at the end? I know I was ripping through really quick and uh, hopefully everything made sense. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it looks like... Uh... No questions coming in. Oh man, that's man, either you did, you did rip through. That was yeah. that was <laughs> that was a lot to take in. <laughs> that's yeah. Thought, man, it was awesome though. It was. <laughs> Thanks, it man. was. It's really cool. It's really cool to see that Excalibur looks awesome. I'm definitely checking that out. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Go make video games. Uh, video games are great. Um, uh, and uh, if folks have questions uh, that they want to send to me, I uh, hit me up on Twitter or shoot me an email or uh, throw it here in the chat here uh, in the next few minutes. And I know we- have a place that you're posting all the information, all those links you just posted that page since? Yeah, I'll, uh, these slides are public. Um, so uh, I'll uh, share the link here, but uh, I'll send this to you, Curtis. Okay. Uh, but these slides are public, so go ahead and uh, check them out. All the links are available there. Um, uh, yeah, I know that was a lot of content really fast and I was talking really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll do this. I'll post the, uh, the link into our chat so people can access that right away. Um, and then if, uh, everybody thanks for attending, please make sure to hit the survey button down at the bottom and fill out the information for us. I appreciate it. Eric, awesome job. That was great. I love that you used the word dope in the middle of your presentation. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. I'm straight out of the 90s here. <laughs> it's all goody. It's all goody. Um, happy Monday, everyone. Thank you.